for people who know about negotiation, public dispute resolution, or environmental planning, uh, among other areas, he uh, has, um, I, I forget that, how many doctoral students have we graduated now? Almost 100. Almost 100, at least 100. Uh, and he has decisively shaped the way which we think about dispute resolution and negotiations and generally in a range of areas, the way in which diplomacy and, and conflict relate to each other, natural resources. Among other things, Larry published a, uh, with the help of uh, two capable doctoral students, a global survey of uh, land claims of indigenous people, how they play out, which we published in the Human Rights Program a few years ago. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have Larry. Uh, your hands. Thanks. Um, we will be talking about rights in different contexts and in different ways. Um, Jung will present first and talk about land sovereignty. And then Priscilla will be second and talk about new rights of uh, land and territory. And then Harry will talk about the rights of peasants. And then Ruth will offer our reactions to the three different presentations. Um, we want very much, with what time we will have after those presentations, to see if we can get a more sustained exchange with people in the audience on the issue of rights. So it won't be necessary that you direct questions specifically to a person or a comment that they made. We, see us only a small window of time to involve everybody in the discussion about rights and whether emphasis on rights is a way to respond to land grabs or to this broader set of crises leading to land grabs of various kinds. Oh, all right, we're changing the order because of the order of the presentations on the computer. Is that there is a technical problem with the PowerPoint uh, equipment. Okay, so, Henry, you, you want to use the podium? Yeah, what do you want to say? Can I say? You can do it. Okay. 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 Uh, 
uh, Professor Bishuter, starting with a very precise uh, term about what, what, how we should uh, define uh, the food crisis then, because there, is, there was a special session in the United Nations Human Council, usually a special session dealing with crisis like now Ukraine, like uh, uh, any countries in Africa, but now with a very specific uh, on food, food crisis at the time. So exactly what the starting as a formulation of expression of uh, of, a, of a life from from uh, persons or medicine meet with this event, meet with the whole uh, uh, process of the United Nations. So this is uh, very important. Second, what also important in this process is that uh, there is a change in you. In the, in the mechanism of the UN system, uh, from Commission to the Council, which really uh, up the, the authority, uh, but also uh, the subcommissions so become advisory committee. So in 2008, 2009, uh, the formulation of this advisory committee did not really condense at the time. So we have a window to put this uh, uh, initiative through the advisory committee and it was taken up by the council. Uh, of course, the member states at the time was very surprised, very, uh, very uh, uh, struck, I would say, because suddenly we are talking about peasants. Not only right to food, but really specific on peasants. Resistance is of course there, but we try to uh, manage uh, to, to lobby uh, governments on, on formulations. And uh, that we came up with uh, what, what, what we call as a declaration of uh, rights of patients and other people working in rural areas. This is, spe the special, uh, this is specific name in United Nations. But uh, La Via Campesina in 2002 up to 2007, named this set of rights as a declaration of rights of women and men peasants. Because, you know, in, in Castellano, it's campesinas, campesinos. So it, it should be both translated into, into uh, any other languages. So this is, this is how formulation started. Uh, then, uh, in the council, uh, because this is all standard, uh, the work of the human system, it should start with the impact. The impact and go to the cause of a uh, food crisis. And the council pointing out in, in what they call as discriminations. Uh, the word discrimination was, uh, was widely used by advisory committee, but also uh, the council, of course, with uh, with the system from, from uh, big voting countries. Uh, but it's still, uh, it, it is managed that uh, it would come up with uh, 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 this formulation discrimination. Because of discriminations, uh, the process would begin with, with the establishment of rights. This is the, the, the UN logic, yeah. uh, the, the how, how it works. But really, for, for peasants, it is back again to to uh, to what render obvious, what render unobvious, because this is also how they want to pronounce the the existence in the life. So, for example, uh, there's a joke when we, when we lobby government, so they will ask us, as a, "Who are you? What do you want?" So, but it's exactly the formulations. Uh, in the whole situation of uh, uh, food crisis. And the third point, uh, the relations between uh, food, right to food and rights of peasant is really important. That's why I, in my article I also connect this with, with this uh, recent uh, development in the US law. It's, uh, in, this is in, in the US healthcare law. Connects between uh, health with the rights of citizens to, to get insurance and how it connects interstate. 
not only one state, but how the legality interstate. This is also exactly the idea of uh, this uh, declaration of patience, because La Via Campesina has been present uh, in uh, around 70 percent, and each of countries has uh, practices, 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 and it pronounced really uh, the, 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 the existence of uh, peasants in, in the modern, modern state. And how it's, uh, we create the legality internationally, interstate, because we also have a, have a Treaty of Vienna, which meaning the international law govern international, international govern international, so we, we need this, this formulation in international context. That's also the, the idea uh, of uh, declarations. And, and the last point, I will uh, also uh, a bit uh, name some of the components of, uh, of the rights, because also if, if government asks, uh, who are you, what do you want? So declaration of rights is really, the, the set is never mind about the formulation, because at the start, the formulation is really conversation between uh, colleagues of person, so it's really the formulation really, really there. But if if we look at the condensed, the the, 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 the compressed idea is it, it relates with the idea of polyculture as opposed to a kind of fordism way of uh, doing things, including in agriculture. And second one is the quality of decision making. That is why this is not only in the context of state, but also men and women, also, the, the quality of this making. The third point is the commons. We discuss really a lot about this one. And the fourth point is uh, good interaction between societies. So persons, organizations really understand if they do have a healthy relation between urban populations, uh, because Peasant organizations also think that uh, the, the highly industrial uh, food commodities really also creates a uh, meaning of relation between rural and urban also. So peasant organizations also have, have to, to formulate uh, the relation between uh, rural and urban in the, at that point. And the last one is the recognitions. So this is this is important, yeah, because the peasants, the declaration of peasant did not solely ask for for state to do something, but if they were if they doing something, how the state, the state will recognize us? So it's if we do this, uh, do the law protect us? So this is also uh, important. So uh, not asking step to do more, but uh, how government will create framework for them to authorize themselves to do something to create uh, uh, what will become visible and visible. Thank you. presentation uh, is a very rough, uh, very visualized sketch of an idea of uh, the three of us, myself and uh, two comrades, Jenny Franco and uh, Sophia Monsanto, in a very uh, initial and rough uh, stage of uh, trying to brainstorm uh, this idea of uh, a land sovereignty. Uh, and it's it is more of a rough sketch from a political activist uh, perspective than a neat uh, academic uh, essay. So this is very under theorized uh, from an academic uh, perspective. So those are some of the caveats uh, put forward in the beginning. 
uh, we have uh, a number of uh, uh, key messages here. One is that uh, the converging crisis and, and or newer character patterns of production, circulation, and consumption has resulted in the revaluation of land in multiple ways and sites. Rural, agricultural, non-agricultural, one. Urban, agricultural, urban, non-agricultural, two. Third, peri-urban, agricultural, peri-urban, non-agricultural, third. Three key sites in both the south and north. Uh, second, transnational agrarian movements remain key actors within the, uh, broad global justice movements as one of the most widespread and most politically coherent networks. Thus, how they position in the broader justice movement politics does matter. Third, the objective condition of the land struggle front demands for a cross-class alliance, similar to what we currently witness at the food politics front, with a truly cross-class alliance political project, objectively speaking or subjectively, uh, namely uh, food sovereignty, which is not just a middle peasant uh, political project, but is both rural, urban, non-peasant, peasant kind of uh, uh, cross-class political project. Fourth, at the land front, which is also necessarily a property struggle front, the framing remains very narrow via the conventional idea of land reform, or reforma agraria, which is inherently and dominantly rural agricultural, based on an idea of the centrality of the middle peasant. It is central and principal, no doubt about it, but not the only key land struggle front today. This framing does not even, this framing, I mean the conventional land reform framing as the catch-all response to the current uh, global land enclosures today, this framing does not even capture the full extent of rural agricultural front. It doesn't really capture rural forest uh, dwellers, indigenous peoples, communities, rural pastoralists, rural fisher folks, semi-rural proletariat, where the framing of land reform may not only uh, have any attraction to them, but actually they are really allergic to them for historical reasons. Fifth, there is an urgent need to reframe the master frame to try to pave the way for a broader pro cross-class political project, a land sovereignty political project linked to uh, the food sovereignty political process might offer some initial relevant discussion points. It attempts to capture both the defensive uh, working people's counter enclosure campaign on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, the working people's enclosure campaign. So both the defensive and uh, proactive uh, struggle uh, fronts. Uh, I start by doing a very quick uh, competing assumptions, very elementary competing assumptions about land to different social groups uh, that are uh, uh, usually taken for granted in uh, very sophisticated uh, 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 debates. Uh, one is that land itself is a very important economic factor of production, and probably this is the most dominant uh, understanding of why land is important. And indeed that is uh, quite important, but it's not the only thing. Land also is not just a normal uh, uh, resource, because it is also key to, other, to access other resources. To, to, to grab or capture water, probably you would need to have a particular kind of land control to capture uh, water, to capture subsoil uh, resources. You would have probably need to have a particular kind of land control. These days we talk a lot about capturing trees and forests for carbon sequestration and other things. You would need a particular kind of land control. That put land in a very special uh, 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 way as a resource. In many instances, at first glance, we see that it's about land policy, but a deeper look at it, uh, it's not about land policy, it's about capture of labor. In many places, uh, historically, that's the case. But also, of course, we know that uh, for many people, we talk about a lot of all those other things, but it doesn't occur to them. For them, land is not those, but it's land where they have their community, where their people reproduce as people over time and that's a territory for them. To reduce uh, land in any of those things 
actually is uh, the very elementary take of point of many of the, the conflicting and competing interpretation of uh, why land is important and what is to be done. And I think it's always important to uh, go back to that. And I think since yesterday and today, uh, that has been, uh, this has been uh, emphasized in uh, various ways. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, going back to the discussion yesterday by Phil and uh, uh, Ruth, uh, there's this changed global context. Uh, we have the, the, the food crisis, uh, energy uh, crisis, uh, uh, paving the way for the rise of biofuels. There's all, all these talks about uh, climate change mitigation strategies, including uh, Red Plus. Then we have uh, the financial crisis. All these uh, multiple converging crises uh, uh, revalued land in a big way. But they are not the only ones, because at the same time, it coincided with the rise of uh, the BRICS and other very important middle-income countries, mixed uh, in very changing uh, uh, patterns of uh, uh, consumption in terms of quantity and, uh, and character. Know that revalued land in a big way, resulting to the global land rush. This is the report of the World Bank. Uh, about the land rush, but it's not just about revaluation of agricultural land in rural areas in the south, but it's much more uh, uh, encompassing than that. But going back to the more uh, traditional uh, understanding of global enclosures, is more, which is more agricultural land, uh, the assumption is quite simple for uh, uh, neoclassical economists, for mainstream uh, uh, thinkers, they thought that well, this is the best thing that ever happened to the global economy when uh, corporations and national governments are once again interested in rural economy and in land. Uh, there are some problems that we can tweak uh, that, those problems by managing it. So there, there, there are starting points that there are multiple crises, but don't worry, there are uh, solutions to that. And the solution lies mainly in the existence of marginal, underutilized, empty, and available lands. And they did all this sophisticated technical accounting for this uh, lands, and they come up with this basic data that in the minimum there are 445 million hectares of these kinds of land worldwide. And if they tweak some of the variables like population density, they can go up to 1.7 billion hectares of land. What does it mean? It means that as we speak today, there are 1.5 billion hectares of agricultural cultivated land. What they were saying is that we can double uh, the, the quantity of actually cultivated land without displacing anybody because these lands are assumed to be empty and, more importantly, available lands. Are they? Now we witness so many conflicts because they are not. Many, at least many of them are not uh, these kinds of description. But in official uh, uh, documents of national governments in national capital, they are like this. But in real life, they are not. So uh, the, the point is that the overall result is that there's this big time revival of the importance of land. Uh, but more people are confronted by, by all sorts of uh, land questions. Uh, both in the south and in uh, the north as well. As I said, rural agricultural, non-agricultural, urban agricultural, non-agricultural, peri-urban agricultural, non-agricultural. In terms of uh, land property relations change, there are two broad uh, trajectories of social change brought by this uh, uh, recent land revival, and it is important to frame uh, the subsequent discussion on uh, alternatives. One, first trajectory is that when the land is needed but the labor or people are not, then as Tanya Lee would have formulated, almost always the result is the expulsion of people from the land. Uh, this, is, this is especially true uh, when you have industrial large-scale mechanized uh, uh, types of agricultures or monocropping of eucalyptus uh, industrial tree plantations where Probably a, a thousand hectares of soya plantation would just need one labor to operate uh, a combined harvester. They expel uh, labor, essentially. But they also expel a lot of, uh, uh, of people from uh, high value uh, urban lands, is, uh, like uh, uh, especially economic zones in India or the urban peri urban uh, sites in, uh, in China. But expulsion of, uh, from the land also takes different uh, trajectories. Expelling people, but getting absorbed, oh my goodness, uh, in uh, practical sectors of the economy, uh, we can debate about it whether it's good or bad, but there's, we know that uh, not 
all uh, radical scholars who believe that it's something bad, as long as they are proletarianized and absorbed in productive sectors of society. But the problem is that when they are expelled, that they are not absorbed in any productive sectors of the society, they become surplus population, and that becomes all, uh, that, that brings, its all, bring, brings in all, a lot of uh, trouble. The second other trajectory is when the land capital also need land as well as cheap labor and people. Where, where this happens, uh, people are not expelled, but they are actually integrated into the emerging enterprises. The struggles there become more like uh, struggles over the terms of their incorporation. Stepping back, what we see today is that while land grabs are indeed very compelling and very urgent a burning issue today worldwide, it's not the only issue. Uh, uh, it's not the only compelling and urgent land issue today. Uh, we also see the more generic land concentration uh, uh, through different uh, processes, dispossession through social differentiation, previous land grabs that happened uh, centuries ago. Uh, but what we see are two broad processes. The current land grabs that normally, usually uh, involve extra economic coercion on, on the one side and the generic land concentration on the other side. And I think it's always important to see them that way. That brings us to looking at three broad struggle fronts worldwide today. Uh, struggles against expulsion, two, struggles against exploitation and adverse incorporation, and third, struggles for redistribution and recognition not to be seen as land struggles in a land-centric way, but in a more coherent and uh, uh, comprehensive way involving labor, land use, environment, among others. And again, I come back and I kept repeating this because I think that frames a lot about the, the, what we will uh, discuss today. My point is that conventional land reform, reform agraria, is too narrow and exclusionary as a master frame. Land grabs, generic land concentration today, your uh, uh, catch-all uh, solution to that is the conventional land reform. It is very important and urgent, but it is very narrow to be a master frame for a, a potential uh, cross-class uh, political project today. It does not capture uh, all the essential uh, issues there. I want to uh, do that. I go to uh, what is to be done. I have, I think, seven minutes. <laughs> I, I have two minutes, okay. What is to be done? Uh, an idea around land sovereignty is a possible step forward. Uh, the definition is very broad and vague. We just define land sovereignty as the right of working class people to have effective access to, control over, and use of land and live on it as a resource and territory. Uh, it's, it's the right to land. It's the working class people's uh, right to land. The, the term is very awkward. We couldn't think of any other term uh, about it. But it brings uh, sovereignty in two senses. One, it brings in the state, it, it, bringing, it brings in the state uh, back into the discussion here. And then, but it also brings in uh, the notion of sovereignty, which is more of a popular uh, sovereignty. Uh, it's not an either or, a state-led or a community-led kind of a thing. Uh, for us, what we are thinking more of like a sandwich strategy, which would differ from one society to another, depending on the historical trajectory of those societies. What is land sovereignty in actual policy and political expression? We thought that it should be diverse and broad and flexible. Diverse and broad and, uh, diverse and uh, broad in terms of uh, property regimes, we thought that uh, it should be, it, it inherently has to be plural, private, community, state, and it should be individual and collective, depending on the historical uh, trajectories of societies. There's no, we, we all hate about the specific model of Western private proper, uh, property regime. We don't want to repeat the same modeling uh, of different counter narrative across societies. It's more like a, a, a broad diverse uh, kind of way of doing it. Uh, we see a lot of egalitarian land relations ba based on property, private ownership. Many of the uh, outcomes of land re redistributive land reforms are in private ownership, and they are very egalitarian. But we also see a lot of commons, community, communal uh, la la land areas that are really of so many uh, inequalities and problems therein. 
So we don't want to be dismissing private property altogether, but we also want to avoid romanticizing a communal commons uh, system. Plurality it comes in different forms, and again, it comes back here, the three sides that I, I kept saying, but it should be also be flexible. It's not just about redistributing or distributing land based on who's here and now, but anticipates with great care and calculation demographic dynamics, future land use, uh, land users, uh, mechanisms to make sure that there are per perpetual revolving land reserves for the future. Who are we to decide? And then we allocate everything now and no more time. Uh, well, I, just 30 seconds. Uh, so, uh, broad and flexible uh, are some of the characteristics. This is the final uh, uh, slide. Character of land sovereignty as a political project, three points to, to just wrap it up. As a framework for a political project along the, class tradi the tradition of food sovereignty that is inherently and objectively a cross-class political project across the north-south divide. And I think that's, that should be a, a, a principal uh, character of any uh, uh, land uh, struggles today. B, as a master frame that can provide broad and necessarily diverse and flexible alternative property regimes within and between societies uh, that put back social relations as the unit of inquiry and intervention over policy or administrative form. Uh, and third, a political project that captures both the defensive and proactive forms of the struggle for land control towards both uh, people's counter enclosure campaign and people's proactive enclosure initiative. Thank you very much. Raj, 
uh, to push for um, an alternative conception of human rights. Uh, and in relation to land, it's really emphasizing not only rights but also responsibilities. Uh, it also uh, re-articulates individual and communities' uh, rights, uh, the rights of uh, people and the rights of nature, the rights of Mother Earth, uh, and an attempt to really uh, go beyond many of the divisions that have been uh, created in the human rights um, project, the way it has developed. Um, and I will uh, study, what I'm studying is really how these conceptions of human rights that emerge from the ground are then institutionalized and how they get codified with a focus on the UN, the uh, international human rights um, arena, uh, and what happens in this process of codification. I won't have really time to go into this today, but uh, that's really uh, the focus of my research. And then, of course, uh, since this is a movement strategy, it was this, uh, touched uh, upon by Neil. Uh, it's a, it's a movement strategy to pursue the institutionalization, but of course there's a lot of internal tensions within movements, uh, and many activists oppose this you know, from a strategic perspective because it's very resource-consuming and time-consuming, oppose the very pursuit of, uh, of institutionalizing new rights and development. Okay, and the other focus is really uh, from a social movement studies perspective, looking at how the issues are being framed uh, by the movement. So in, the, in my paper, I look at the a uh, global campaign for uh, agrarian reform that is a joint endeavor of the Jacob Seen and Fian. Uh, June has written a paper on this. Uh, and so I look at how um, land issues have been framed. Uh, initially, I would say in terms of a right to agrarian reform, although this term was never really formally used, but that was really the idea, you know, in 99 when the campaign was launched. And how now, um, as, as June just uh, brilliantly said, there a, a, a profound reframing needs to happen because uh, a correct reform doesn't really work anymore as a narrative. Okay, so um, quickly, so this global campaign for grand reform uh, was a joint project by FIAN, uh, the International Organization for the Right to Food, uh, and Nadia Campesina. And for FIAN, the focus was really uh, the uh, the challenge was really uh, double, I think. To first um, emphasize that de depriving individuals and communities of access to resources was a human rights violation. So it was really to push for a uh, an agrarian, I would say, a progressive, both agrarian and progressive understanding of the right to food, and at the same time insist that uh, putting in place agrarian reform programs was a state obligation. So to do that, um, FIAN both relied on the right to food as codified in international law, uh, mostly in its communications to states, but in its, uh, in its communications to activists and the broader public, the organization used a right to feed oneself uh, frame. Uh, but I, I, would, uh, I would say that this, this framing was a, a failed attempt, uh, because uh, if we look at first discussions between FIAN activists and Via Campesina activists, in the 90s, uh, they tried really, I mean, this, is, this, was being, this has been told by, by FIAN activists, they tried to convince uh, uh, the Campesina activists to endorse this frame, and they were uh, met by resistance because the right to sovereignty frame was already um, emerging strongly. And, and, and actually, uh, FIAN later abandoned this right to feed oneself frame, also because they wanted to uh, incorporate. Uh, other issues that they felt were not adequately addressed by this agrarian focus, which was issues of nutrition and, and uh, the right to food of urban populations. Anyway, for Via Campesina, the challenge was, was different. They did not feel, and this is really important, they, they did not feel constrained by the, the confines of international human rights law, the way it had been codified. And so they came very strongly with uh, new human rights, such as the right to produce, the right to be a peasant, the right to land, the right not to disappear, appears very strongly in many documents. Uh, against the, the strong enemy here was, was the World Bank and Titan programs, and, and with a generalized uh, message, which you know could be a problem, but can be also quite effective in global arenas, uh, in favor of the social fraction of the land and communal uh, use, tender and ownership. Uh, so I've touched on this alternative conception of rights that has emerged from peasant movements, and this is interestingly uh, a European. Um, uh, uh, forum that took place, and, and it's I think quite striking to see this kind of language emerge uh, from peasant movements, but also uh, other social actors in a European context. This was a follow up to the Nine uh, Forum of 2007, but to, that took place um, in Europe. Okay, so now to shortly introduce the International uh, Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. Uh, here are some of the rights that are covered uh, in that declaration. 
Uh, as you will see, Article 4 is the one that uh, touches on the right to land and territory. So this is one example of uh, really a, a bundle of rights that emerge from the grassroots and that they're now being pursued uh, at the uh, UN level and that are being institutionalized. And of course, it will be really interesting to see what happens to this innovative way of framing them as a, as a process uh, of, of negotiation uh, goes on the way. Because of course, now that uh, an open-ended working group has been formed, the text is now uh, discussed by government delegations still using the Akampesina document as a draft, which I think is, is a major accomplishment. Uh, so here are the various uh, elements that you found under the right to land uh, article that you read. I think quite interesting is the right to reject uh, acquisitions of land, and of course the rejection of uh, forced evictions. Um, yeah. So I'll skip that. But, uh, this, this is to pick up, uh, Henry alluded to the discrimination argument that was used to convince the Human Rights Council to take this on. But I think if you talk to the Akamsin activists, they will also emphasize uh, that, that other um, social groups have achieved a declaration such as women's indigenous peoples, and they really feel strongly that they're also entitled now their declaration. So there's an issue of, of legal inclusion here, I would say, of, of recognition. Um, here is a picture of Henry Saradi, who is the former Secretary General uh, of the Via Campesina and who is one of the leading figures to together with the other Henry that we have the honor to have here uh, in, in bringing this up uh, at the Europe. Uh, of course, uh, there's likely going to be a lot of uh, contentious uh, discussions taking place at the Human Rights Council when it is um, uh, when um, discussions will take place on actually recognizing land, uh, rights to resources, land, seeds. The text also, uh, for example, rejects intellectual property rights overseas. We already know that's going to be very contentious. And another issue is, of course, who is a peasant and how do you define that social category? There's a good paper by Mark Edelman on this issue of how do you alienate that category. Okay, so quickly, um, there's another arena that uh, Via Campesina has invested uh, to defend an alternative con conception of land rights, and this was discussed yesterday by Philip. Uh, and, and just to say that um, this is largely uh, regarded by um, social um, movements uh, and, and the civil society mechanism that works within the CFS as an achievement. And certainly it is an achievement in the sense that the CFS is this alternative governance mechanism that allows uh, UN bodies, states, and civil society to participate. And so this, this, this document was really negotiated by all those parties. But I must also say that uh, the achievement, uh, which is to have uh, <coughs> achieve the recognition of legitimate tenure rights in that document really relies on, on this enormous ambiguity because the term of legitimate tenure rights, which appears 37 times in the in the uh, parliamentary guidelines, uh, really is never defined. And, and when you would talk to delegates, you would get very different uh, understandings, of course, of what is a legitimate tenure right. And so the, the challenge here, of course, is going to be of the implementation. What the voluntary guidelines suggest is that uh, at the national level, uh, roundtables will be organized uh, to discuss uh, basically land uh, issues. But of course, this, this is a multi-stakeholder approach that has, in my opinion, um, a high risk of, of not being able to account for power, uh, uh, balance, uh, yeah, power relations that we've talked a lot about. Um, within the movement, of course, uh, you see a lot of um, um, yeah, discussions taking place. Uh, some people are enthusiastic about seeing those uh, efforts to get those new rights codified in, in international law, and some other people think that uh, you know there's a, there's a, a difficult battle being uh, fought on the ground, that this is a waste of time and resources, and we should really consecrate, con concentrate our efforts on developing alternatives on the ground that are working. Uh, one of the way that these alternative uh, building strategies are conceived of is is to first secure land and, and, and territory and control that territory and then within that territory establish different rules and establish different ways of producing. So agroecology, uh, short, uh, different relations between consumers and producers of food, etc. Uh, and here we, I, I just uh, gathered some quotes, but there's um, a very strong, um, yeah, I think a very strong uh, moment that, that I can feel in the movement, which is, you know, let's just do it ourselves. Let's just not wait for the state or the UN to, 
rent uh, plus these rates, let's, uh, let's split ourselves. Uh, and, and I think there's a, a, a bit of an apocalyptic uh, narrative also that you can sense here at the community level, there's a very strong sense of, you know, things are going to, you know, get worse, uh, we're going to have less and less access to water, seeds, and, and we'll need to uh, really take our future in our hands at, at the community level to survive. Um, so in this context, as, as June uh, said, the uh, old agrarian reform frame really isn't working it anymore. Uh, there's been attempts already, uh, this, this, uh, this paper uh, published in the Journal of Present Studies by Peter Rossi, to reconceptualize um, uh, agrarian reform from a territorial perspective. This is the result of a dialogue also with indigenous peoples and other constituencies, pastoralists, etc. Um, from a food sovereignty perspective, at least for articulated, and I think uh, June really uh, presented it, uh, presented already uh, in a compelling way. Uh, Open questions remain within that, uh, that uh, evolving thinking, which is how to secure the rights uh, of women to land and, and how to um, use um, the demand for agrarian reform uh, also in relation to other concerns for, for building uh, self-determination and autonomy at the community level and resist appropriation. So are individual or communal rights best able to resist appropriation at the community level? Uh, so one emerging frame I see for future land struggles is, is this land sovereignty frame uh, that uh, June presented, uh, which has the advantage, I think, of, of potentially incorporating those, all those struggles for reclaiming um, yeah, production systems uh, from below and all those struggles that are taking place everywhere, including in, in our cities and in connection with, uh, with farmers outside of the cities, um, which is, is probably never going to get institutionalized, which might be a good thing for taking the uh, uh, And the alternative would be um, to have a right to land frame uh, emerge, which could be potentially really powerful if, if the process of getting new rights recognized for peasants at the UN is really taken on as a, as a opportunity to have collective discussion on the distribution of, of resources. Uh, I think there's already a tension now uh, among the activists and experts that are supporting this process. Some want to, want to use this window of opportunity to get a text as soon as possible because there's been this extreme you know, opportunity to, to get the Human Rights Council to discuss this, but some other people think, no, the objective is not to have another text uh, and rights that will, in any case, not be enforced. The objective is to use this arena to, to launch a public dialogue at the global level on the um, division of, of resources and, and to really uh, ensure that peasants can start alliances with urban dwellers, fishers, uh, pastoralists, etc. Uh, and in that case, uh, I think the recognition of right to land with the uh, support of um, right to food, oh sorry, uh, of uh, right to food and other human rights experts could really also enable peasant movements to, to put a limit um, on, on, on the setting of absolute property rights uh, at the national level. And, and when you talk to activists, what you see is they want to go international because they have no more room of maneuver at the national level. So it's, it's really hoping that uh, by going at the global level, you'll be able to bring this back uh, and, and oppose it to the governments at the national level. Thank you. To, to speak and to respond to, I think, three really interesting presentations. I was struck by the, sort of the tensions, this overlap in what you're all saying, and yet quite distinct uh, elements as well. But I, I think what came across for me very strongly was um, the fact that there has been this reappropriation of the concept of peasantry as an attempt to render a livelihood visible, a livelihood that for many uh, urban-centric societies uh, don't see that, that life or see it as a relic of something uh, of, of a world that's, uh, that's on the decline and disappearing. So what I hear from elements of what all of you have said is that uh, the demand, with this reappropriation of the concept of the peasantry, the demands are multiple. On the one hand, there's the demand for recognition to be seen. Uh, there's the demand for protection, that's the defense. Uh, there's the demand for redistribution and expansion and support. 
Um, but I thought it was uh, interesting that in this meeting that actually brings together agrarian scholars and urban-centered people, we are having a discussion around <coughs> peasants' rights. Uh, and that for me is striking, particularly because I come from a context where um, it's increasingly hard to talk about the rural and the urban spaces and populations when in fact rising numbers of people are both rural and urban. Uh, there are systems of oscillating migration with marginal livelihoods lived in multiple spaces. Um, and so when we talk about um, the peasantry, we talk about the peasantry who also migrate to cities at different moments of life, life cycle. And I think that that's a really a challenging concept to get, to get around. So I was thinking about the, some of the commonalities and differences among the presentations here. And I found each of them very interesting. And there were different, uh, different emphases in terms of rights to what, uh, and also uh, whose rights or in whom do they best. Um, and I guess the, the real distinction is between June on the one hand and uh, Henry and Priscilla on the other. Um, I, I almost sort of started to think, thinking about your threefold typology, June, the different spaces, the rural, urban agricultural, you know, um, peri-urban and so on. But in a sense, um, one would imagine that if um, the urban or the peri-urban uh, lobby groups, the shack dwellers and so on, had a declaration equivalent to La Via Campesina's 2008 declaration, there would be strong overlaps and there would be strong differences. And that mm -hmm. one could almost imagine the Venn diagram emerging of the common struggles and the distinct demands. Um, and so that's the way in which I conceive um, the differences among what you have been putting forward, that in a sense, uh, the separate organization of sectors, of peasants, as opposed to others, is in a sense uh, the immediate tactic. But the wider strategy is what June has outlined as land sovereignty, which is a unifying frame. Uh, to, to basically to win across these, these broad principles and to reinforce struggles across space. So that was one set of thoughts. Um, the second was, um, and this is, yeah, I would be interested to hear maybe Priscilla's response. Um, a lot of what I heard of in terms of the, sort of the demand for sovereignty was about self-determination, for autonomy almost a sense of uh, the demand for a right to be left alone, to live uh, a separate life, to live the life that uh, we're entitled to define ourselves. Or is it about the right to choose the terms of incorporation? Um, and here what I felt um, there are sort of sudden silences around is the relationship between the demands of the peasant movement for land and territory, as you articulated um, that, uh, Priscilla, versus um, a foundational um, part of La Via Campesina, which is about contesting the global corporate food system. And so what I hear there is not a demand to be left alone, it's not a demand for separation from, but it's a demand for changed uh, terms of incorporation. And I didn't hear much about that latter part in what you presented. Um, yeah, this concept of, sort of sovereignty, I think, is a very powerful one, and maybe uh, the, the suggestion of separation and sort of self-rule uh, is, is, is a politically powerful one um, because uh, to me sovereignty indicates a spectrum of different types of entitlements uh, beyond land rights, beyond land. Um, so it does have the sort of multiple levels of meaning um, that relate to a spatial and territorial dimension uh, but also a form of governance and self-governance, um, which I think is interesting. So one of the questions that I would ask to June, and I didn't quite get your sandwich strategy, perhaps you can go back to that, but um, in this conception of land sovereignty, where is the space, and in such a people-centered campaign, what is the space of the state? I'm aware that these ideas are coming out of peasant movements that have often experienced states as either violent or negligent. And I wonder if there's a more constructive conception of the role of the state um, in your notion of, of land sovereignty. So, um, and then perhaps to, um, to Henry, I was very interested uh, in what uh, Hanoch uh, Degan 
said this morning about exclusion, he was, uh, and if I understood him right, he was saying that um, the, a definitional component of property is exclusion. Yeah. And so what I wonder about, and also thinking about what Sonia mentioned, thinking about squatter movements, is in what way does this demand, set of demands from peasant rights, are there forms that can avoid the logic of exclusion? Um, uh, for instance, uh, this idea that the reoccupation, occupation or reoccupation, the moment of success, can sub, uh, succumb into uh, a defensive and exclusionary form. So I wonder about the permeability of, of the vision that you articulate, Henrik. Um, uh, and just finally, perhaps going back to you, Priscilla, thinking about um, the corporate food system and the relationship between land and territory and the economic system within which it is located, which uh, extends so far beyond and involves actors uh, including global corporations. Um, I wonder about not only thinking about the state, but about within your framing of peasant rights, um, the how private capital is implicated as, uh, as a duty bearer of some form uh, in the conception of, of peasant rights. Um, I enjoyed uh, one of your thoughts, which was about, I sort of understood as some kind of ambivalence or skepticism about the idea of codifying uh, and institutionalizing uh, elements of rights. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to expand or explain a little bit about that. Is this about a fear of losing dynamism? Is it about um, uh, a fear of uh, demobilization? Um, essentially, I, I see there's a bit of tension between the strategies being taken up, which on the one hand are trying to get formal recognition, and on the other hand are skeptical or, or ambivalent about that, uh, perhaps in line with the idea that um, rights are not simply things that are given downwards, but are demonstrated upwards. Um, and that perhaps, uh, particularly in terms of the notion of sovereignty, it's about creating pockets that, that demonstrate this and assert and exercise those rights as a basis for them to, to filter upwards. So, um, Ruth has posed a question or a challenge to each of the speakers. I want to give them each a minute or two to respond to one or two of the points that she raised. And that will still leave us close to half an hour for conversation with the rest of you. So, be thinking of the specific question you want to pose or the comment you want to make about rights or any aspects of the definition of rights, rights for whom, which kinds of rights, under uh, what circumstances. Uh, because we, we, we want to try to have a group conversation about rights and not just back and forth with each person. But let me ask each of you if you care to respond to um, any one of the specific questions or points that, that Ruth made. On, on the question of state. Uh, historically and uh, today, almost always uh, where uh, people are expelled from their land, uh, it's the state that uh, actually uh, do the, the expelling of uh, people from the land. So the state is uh, implicated in a big way in, a, in the current uh, global land enclosures uh, then and, and now. It's also, uh, basically we see the state uh, as having a, this permanent dual task of uh, facilitating uh, capital accumulation on the one hand, but it also has the permanent function of maintaining a minimum level of uh, historically determined uh, minimum level of political legitimacy on the other hand. And those are two contradictory tasks of the, of the modern state. And so we will see uh, this contradiction that uh, in all these uh, land uh, 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 expulsions that uh, we see also possibilities uh, for maneuvering in a struggle in the context contested space of, of the state. The state is a problem, and it's also part of uh, whatever solution that uh, we have. Uh, in the minimum, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's quite important to always locate whether we are advocating for social mobilizations from below, not to look at it from an isolationist way, but always look at it and understand it in a relational way, in relation to the, to, to the state. And, uh, 
in other, on other occasions, we see that uh, there are also promising uh, political projects where actually we see uh, some uh, mobilizations from below to assert uh, uh, land rights on the one hand and some uh, reform initiatives from above within the state facilitated more often uh, because of incoherent, incoherence of in, within the state or it splits among the ranks of, of the uh, state leagues uh, and we see actually uh, in many okay, on many occasions significant reforms uh, in the land front were facilitated through a, some form of tactical alliance between these uh, two groups from these two institutions, whether they shared strategic views about the reforms or, or not. But I would say uh, we, it, it's not, uh, it's not uh, very useful to romanticize a community-led, community-centric view about land struggles on the one hand and dismissing uh, the role of the state on the other hand. Thank you. Uh, I will respond on two points uh, that Luther asked one, but I will add one thing. Uh, the exercise of formulation is really interesting, if not only in, inside Via Campesina, but also inside in the UN, because uh, at the very first time, uh, the declaration says only about women and men present, period. But when it goes into uh, the United Nations, there is another element which uh, inevitably should be included or integrated into the concept of presence. Those are including of indigenous group, uh, rural women, agricultural worker, uh, pastoralist, a herder, uh, and also a fisher, fisher folk. This is in the report. So uh, governments uh, try to, to 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 formulate this with the, with the term other people working in rural areas. This this is the term. But then again, other states okay, okay we cannot we cannot define like that. You know, definition should be precise. But then uh, it's it's a bit uh, a bit uh, interesting because those who want to include others is from. European and United States. They want to not only peasants, of course, because peasants is such a strong word, but uh, the formulation of rural, you know, really rural uh, poverty is a rural phenomenon, uh, you know, so rights also should be a rural phenomenon, that kind of thinking. Uh, on the state, I will add, uh, Jim, I, I agree with you precisely. So, of course, peasants, as I said, is uh, have a difficult relationship with modern state. Really, it's really difficult with them. But at the same time, some exercises, uh, practices by uh, leaders of uh, Via Campesina shows different uh, st st stage of uh, achievements. For example, if we, we, we look at the, at the Basque, uh, Basque country, they are very, really close to the local governments to, in, in, the, in the province, but they're not really in the, in the in the level of national, national one. In Indonesia, uh, peasants union really close to local, uh, provincial, also we will have an elections, <laughs> the student, also to the next governments. So we, it is not a, 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 a la carte uh, strategy. So everything is adjusted, but really the very existence of uh, peasants asserted into into what we call as a modern state and also in the international context of uh, interrelation between modern states. Thank you. Those were really interesting questions. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of um, the is, is, is private capital implicated as a duty bearer, I think that exercise uh, still needs to be done. Uh, I think there's a lot of thinking that now, and you're all invited to participate, um, that needs to be done uh, translating all those rights that are being claimed into uh, states versus states uh, obligations on one hand, and, and I'm saying states, but really we should look at all the different levels of governments that are uh, important to, to include here, from the local to the national to the regional, etc. Uh, and, and the same for private actors. What does this mean in terms of private actors' uh, responsibilities? And so really looking at, for all those uh, 
those rights in the declaration, what, are, what kind of public policies do we need to put in place um, to, to ensure them and, and protect them. So that's, that's one exercise that I think needs to be, to be done. Um, is it a right to be left alone or a right to, um, to what, you, what term did you use, set the terms of incorporation? I think, I would say both. Um, uh, the, the, the demand for autonomy is, is very, very strong when you, when you read rights such as the right to reject uh, industrial agriculture, um, the right to reject development projects. Uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it is about the right to be left alone and to be, uh, you know, uh, able to decide at, at a family or community, community level how you want to produce uh, on your land. Uh, at the same time, you also see uh, demands such as the right to state support. Uh, you know, so there, there's also the awareness that uh, there's a need to, to really uh, invest uh, in, in, in smallholders uh, agriculture. Uh, and, and one interesting right that is being uh, claimed is the right to set the prices for agricultural products. So that, I think that is the right to set, decide on the terms of incorporation in a sense. Uh, on codification, uh, I would say yes, some activists, are, you know, someone said, I'm, I'm scared that the spirit of the document will be lost. Uh, so, to what extent will the document uh, lose this, this emancipatory or subversive nature, you know, uh, nature that it has at the moment once it, it gets negotiated? Uh, but the other people are not that concerned. Uh, the, the reason I'm concerned is that uh, I was interested in hearing uh, Milon say that. Uh, all those, uh, those, those uh, normative developments in the fields of economic, social, cultural rights took place uh, under the, the uh, impetus of uh, civil society, but I think this has changed dramatically. Uh, if we look at uh, developments in the last decades, it was mainly human rights experts, disconnected uh, many often from movements, and, and today movements are in the front seat, but they are assisted and supported by international uh, human rights lawyers, and the terms of that collaboration I think also need to be um, really assessed seriously. Uh, for example, uh, what language is, is uh, acceptable in, in, at the Human Rights Council? Uh, you know, now to get those, those, um, those discuss well, to allow for, for the declaration to make progress in the negotiations, for example, you see uh, human rights lawyers making arguments such as, well, the collective rights that are being demanded that can be transformed into individual rights to be exercised collectively. Okay, or the right to reject, that's too strong. We, we don't want something negative. We can change that into something positive. Uh, that's all fine if you need to do that to make the negotiations you know, progress, but then what's going to happen to the, you know, the spirit of the document? So this is the perspective where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. So our rights, whether they're defined as, as rights, whether they're recategorized or rethought as uh, in terms of sovereignty and not just tenure, whether they're rights of land and territory, will rights be small part, large part, all of the most effective response to the problems of land concentration and land grabs that we've been talking about? So I think you had your hand up first. Okay, so I have no mind. Do I need a mind? Yeah. Well, thanks for a great panel. Um, lots of food for thought there, so to speak. Um, I want to make two comments. One is um, on, on this question of uh, rights, self-rule versus choosing the terms of incorporation. Um, Two things there. One is that um, Bill Campesino talks about being producers of society. So I think when Priscilla mentioned that um, on the one hand autonomy, on the other hand state support, um, I, I think it's really important to think about this, this claim, this vision of um, a reorganized, reconstructed rural um, Region as um, as really fulfilling that uh, that vision. Um, one you know intermediate example probably is the zero hunger campaign in Brazil, where the MST struck a deal with Lula to provide um, cheap staples for low income people, and so they had a, a you know a guaranteed institutional market. And I think that's a, a step forward. It's not the it's not the end point, but I think it's a very important uh, um, you know exemplification of what I'm trying to get at. Choosing terms of incorporation, um, I don't think that goes far enough. Um, that, that's, um, um, I think that's a, a weak formulation. 
Um, so that uh, if, if, you, if we're really talking about being producers of society and stewards of, of, the, of the soil, um, then I think we're, we need to take that uh, much further. So the, the, second, the second issue is the sovereignty issue, and I, th I think this is a fascinating question that came up. Um, my understanding of Via Campesina's first sovereignty concept is that um, it's not just about um, self-rule or being left alone or autonomy. Um, it's not just about choosing terms of incorporation. Um, initially, I think it was a way of problematizing the concept of sovereignty in general um, by, at the same time, politicizing the neoliberal conception of food security, which is providing food through the global market to be marketed by transnational corporations and folks having um, access to food by, by having the right to, to, to purchase food as opposed to simply the right to food. So, um, you know, within that framework, I think, um, as I've said before, I think it's, a, it's a, at least a two-step process. First of all, problematizing uh, that conception of sovereignty um, when it's entirely contradicted by neoliberal food security policies, um, and therefore, um, <coughs> demanding that, um, and this is what Olivier has been pushing for um, in the UN, demanding that um, states have the right to rebuild, reconstruct um, domestic food security um, on their own terms. So that's the first point. And the second part of it, I think, is um, reformulating or reorganizing the state itself. So, so not just sort of saying, well, let's, let's um, choose our terms of incorporation, um, let's transform the state. But it's a two-step process. First of all, you have to have the right to domestic food security against the agreement um, on agriculture and the WTO. Um, and then secondly, you begin to transform um, what the state is. And this, is, this goes back to, I think, just quickly, Hannah Whitman's notion of agrarian citizenship, which I think um, shifts the terms away from citizenship being an urban conception towards uh, taking very seriously that um, societies won't survive unless they take seriously how they manage the land. Um, and then a third part of this, I think, is the um, critique, uh, the implicit or explicit critique of the state system, not just the state, but the state system. So the state system in the WTO is, is a sort of collectivized way, in a multilateral sense, of liberalizing agricultural trade um, and undermining um, local food systems. So Jose Bove and, and Francois Dufour back in 2001, I think, um, began to talk about this kind of reformulation of the state system by emphasizing the importance of multilateral or international institutions to recognize um, and or enforce um, rules of fair trade, for example, um, land rights, land user rights, and, and so forth. So, so I think that um, this question of rights can, can be taken uh, further. Thank you. Um, my, uh, I have a question and a comment. The uh, question is about, um, to actually Jun Boras and your idea of uh, the cross-class alliance uh, that we need. And um, I, I cannot agree more, but I wonder um, whether you might want to speak a little bit more about how we might go about actualizing that, uh, not only within countries where it is hard enough to build a cross-class alliance, but in the context of a global uh, economic system um, which governs land around the world. And uh, if we want to truly create cross-class alliances that are also transnational, uh, how does one go about doing that? Um, I, I just have in mind the work of uh, you know, sociologists like Leslie Slayer, Leslie Slayer, you know, the whole theorization of transnational capitalist class as a category, which then has to be taken into account in explaining, for example, some of the structural features of the crisis that we are living through, um, and the inability to formulate structural responses to them. So if you are trying to articulate a, an alliance with uh, members of this transnational capitalist class, how would one go about doing that? And um, the other part of the alliance question uh, is, uh, who were your allies? I mean, this is directed to all of you, because they all spoke about Campesina, Via Campesina. Who were your allies when we were trying to push through this declaration among both other civil society actors, but also in the interstate system? 
within, for example, north-south politics, where there are particular countries or groupings that might have been more sympathetic to the articulation of particular notions of at least some of the rights in the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, because it has so many elements there. Some, there are some states more sympathetic than others. Um, uh, my, my general comment uh, is actually uh, about perhaps the question of sovereignty, which is, I think I agree with Phil, it's a very important question, especially with this articulation of food sovereignty and now land sovereignty. And I, I can imagine, you know, uh, countries in the UN going crazy, and you talk about sovereignty as a legal claim that you want them to recognize. It's almost like they have to recognize, you know, first of all, a redefinition of who they are in many ways. And I can imagine how difficult uh, that is. Uh, uh, but uh, I wonder whether, uh, you know, conceptually speaking, uh, we've been trying to move away uh, in terms of defining property rights from thinking about property as a right to exclude. I mean, if it, there is a sort of a sovereignty aspect, of it, which is sovereignty also often is seen as the right to exclude in the end. There is the historical linkage. In fact, in public law, you know, before the growth of public law and private law, you know, in the medieval period, in fact, the originalists never distinguished between the two. You know, in the end, you had one single notion of, you know, sovereignty, which is also property, and property, which was also sovereignty. And the question was, both were seen as the right to exclude in some way. So is there a way of redefining? So the question of property from below is not only perhaps about defining property or defeating the idea or finding alternatives to the idea of property as a right to exclude. It's also about finding alternatives to the idea that sovereignty is about the right to exclude. Uh, maybe they're connected at a very fundamental conceptual level. I have a, a cue. It starts there. One, two, three was Debbie, four, five, and now I have two more in the back. Uh, as a historian, I've learned a lot from, as a historian, I've learned a great deal from the discourse and the case studies that have been presented here. Um, and most of the papers, and I think the papers we've just heard, um, have at one point or another referred to gender issues. And my, my comment or question is that it seems to me that gender needs to be there at the beginning of the analysis uh, as well as the resolution because, in, at least in the places that I study, uh, women comprise 50% of the population or more. And if we believe in democratic processes, what does it mean when we construct models and uh, analyses that don't take account of that? That's the sort of challenge in a certain way. Um, in, in England, during the enclosure movement, uh, which is a source of so many problematic and influential economic theories, uh, the latest social research in English history um, has indicated that, uh, that women in England during the enclosure movement were the primary commons users. If that was so, then what does it mean to talk about uh, enclosure without dealing with the people most affected by enclosure were women. Um, and the other piece about England has to do with um, the role of women in the opposition to enclosure, uh, where women played a very much larger role than earlier historians had thought uh, in the opposition to enclosure, including uh, women-led and women-organized anti-enclosure uh, demonstrations. Uh, so it seems to me that all of those things really should challenge us, um, challenge our analysis. We need to kind of have that there. The 50% kind of belongs there. Um, the other case that I know about uh, is Kenya, where, uh, again, women were uh, the primary farmers, and they were the primary commons users. 
So in a way, um, certainly under the British, uh, British efforts at enclosure were essentially a kind of war on women because women were the farmers and they were the common seasons. Um, and women were among the strongest opponents to enclosure and privatization. Um, there is increasing um, evidence and research on this, especially um, in the early part of the 21st century. Uh, and certainly the efforts by people like um, well, the most well-known Wangari Matai uh, really speak to that. That is to uh, women as challenging traditional notions of um, property and privatization. Um, let, me, let me interrupt, because we have six people okay. and, six right. minutes, and about so, six or seven minutes. Can talk long enough, Thanks. Six Can we pass the mic down right there? Jubilee Brown University and another historian. Uh, I wanted to follow up on Ruth's excellent provocation and uh, Raj's inquiries about sovereignty because I was reminded of this conversation of the accounting of the human rights movement by Sam Moyne in his last utopia a few years ago, in which he argued that that movement fallen on the shoals of national sovereignty. The problem of the last four decades is the problem of the failures of international government for everyone except international finance. International finance has the IMF, the GA, the World Bank, the rest of us were left dealing with NGOs and dealing with national governments and a war of attrition. So I'm reminded in these conversations of other institutions that have tried to work for small farmers in various ways, and I'm reminded of the constituents of uh, conferences like these, which are inevitably populated by lawyers, anthropologists, historians, the constituency is not economists. We do not provide the macroeconomic theory. And that limits. We've staked out battlegrounds where you can and cannot work. And I, I think that there, I, I see it as a geopolitical playing field in which two armies, the lawyers, of anthropologists, historians, are arrayed against the economists for the control of international institutions. And I'm reminded of another generation that in the, United, in the 1950s, the United Nations and the FAO were planning a worldwide soil survey with the goal of delivering information on which lands were arable and how the best use of which plants were for the service of poor farmers. I wonder what would happen if we raised our stakes to a different international scale of activity and demanded, demanded institutions follow our lead. What would happen with an international property rights cadaster, a land rights cadaster sympathetic to all of the definitions and all of the data from below? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn. Uh, I hear the theme that ran through the whole day as being about power. and. To shifting from a language of economics and com um, commodification, market exchanges, and so on, to empowerment, and I think that's that's really what you know what we're striving for, and and we need something beyond something positive, not just not commodification or not expulsion, and so on. Um, I think rights are so important because rights aren't about giving people something passively. Rights are about empowering people to make assert claims against other people and enforce those claims <coughs> by having the backing of other authorities to back them up. So it, I, I totally think that rights are um, necessary for this enterprise. We <coughs> have to go. Um, when um, Silly said earlier, there are other ways of making property without commodification. I had this wacky association. I thought for a minute, um, you know, um, children, at least in American law, not formally, but in practice, are the property of their parents. Um, parents have, they could do ev everything but sell their kids. Um, and, um, and, and I think, that's a, a 
maybe in some ways a useful analogy, it's in some ways a dangerous analogy, but it's a useful analogy uh, for property in thinking about um, that there's all kinds of things we want people to be able to do with their property, including care for it and be responsible for it uh, and see that it flourishes. That's what parents do. And that's sort of the image of stewardship and so on. So um, that might be a useful metaphor. Um, well, um, one other thought is that uh, through, especially through this panel, um, the themes of reframing were all around um, power, so land sovereignty. And, and that kind of taps into Michael Heller's earlier idea that what we're trying to do with the notion of the liberal commons is integrate individual autonomy with collective decision making somehow. Or, or, and he called it individual sovereignty, I think. Um, Thanks, Deb. Yeah, OK. I just had a reflection on uh, listening to the excellent presentations that, um, that there's another sort of aspect of uh, it's contained in the human rights instruments which goes very close to what you're all talking about. And I was wondering if that's been used more, the right to self determination. I mean, essentially, I mean, states have been reluctant to go very far with that because they think of it as, you know, in a kind of a sort of, that it's talking about independent states. But if you look at the formulation of that right in the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, it's actually talking about internal self-determination. And this goes very close to the issue of uh, sovereignty. It goes very close to the issue of the first right of use. I mean, the formulation is that Right, so intervention means the right to first access to natural resources and means of subsistence, right? So uh, I, I think that might be a useful way. And uh, and this has actually been codified in national laws now. If you look at, I would urge everybody to look very closely at the Forest Rights Act in India, which in a way goes even beyond international law, you know? Uh, that So so th that I think that, that connection might be very useful to make. Thanks. Um, uh, these are comments as an organizer. I'm a tenant organizer uh, in the U.S. Um, a couple of quick things. I, I think the rights discourse does help to mobilize people. Uh, the grassroots people like our members are fired up by using that discourse. Uh, it also helps to, in terms of the broad cross-class uh, alliance that you're talking about, to reach out to middle-class liberals and intellectuals. You know, you can guilt trip. Uh, them to some extent and bring them into an alliance. But it's not sufficient discourse. Um, I think the power analysis and the strategic analysis is what we need to be developing as I'm listening to this all day. Um, the, no one's been talking about targets, who are the enemy, and how that breaks down. Uh, I know in the land rights field, uh, there is a, uh, what's it called, the landmatrix.com is actually developed um, an analysis of who is investing, who are the corporations and the, and the sovereign wealth funds, and what are they buying and where. Um, we don't have that in the urban uh, land field, but I suspect if we did and use that model, it would be the same companies, the same investors, the same hedge funds, etc. even pension funds, as Bill was commenting at lunch. Um, and we need to name these people and, and in order to organize campaigns. And that's another way to fire people up. People get fired up around injustice and class oppression. They identify with that, and, they, and it's an outlet to organize around. And then we can leverage things. We need some victories to bring people into this. Uh, the, the problem with the, the food sovereignty is a terrible slogan. I'm sorry. Uh, it doesn't resonate, in at least in this country. Uh, maybe food control or the right to food, the right to food. But we need language that will work as slogans. Uh, and so I think some brainstorming around that and the academic resources, if they could be mobilized to develop this analysis of where are the pressure points? You know, who do we organize against? What are our demands? Uh, at what point in time do we go to these particular institutions and demand what? Because the, for the first time in history, it's really easy now 
to organize a global campaign. They have coordinated actions in different cities or countries around targets. That is a relatively new phenomenon, and we should, and people are doing that. It is something we could really develop uh, strategically, given our limited resources, uh, and that would help all of us out in the field. So that's my main comment. The, the, another one about uh, getting the right to housing, the, the ECSR treaty ratified in the U.S. Uh, there's, a, there's a strategy involving uh, Senator Markey, who's on the Foreign Relations Committee, and chairs a subcommittee, and Kerry, who lives about a mile from here. Uh, we, the people in this room could help organize a campaign to get hearings and demand ratification of the treaty in this country, and then we would have some additional handles to organize around, which is one of the other utilities of using the, the rights framework. Okay, so thanks. Very briefly, I, I, I see there's a long queue, very stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, let me just ask a, a provocative question, um, uh, I guess, which is the following. One of the key reasons why uh, peasants have been not just not supported, but in fact, in very many cases, actively repressed, is because they were not um, represented in state structures. Um, there was an urban bias, as Michael Lipton called that sometimes in agricultural and food policies, and there was a, a, a sort of um, um, uh, suspicion towards um, uh, peasants uh, as they were, you know, uh, considered as illiterate, backward, and not basically worth uh, the support of the state. And if you read the Declaration of Rights of Peasants, there's nothing about participation in state structures, which in fact is one key principle of the right to food, is the right um, to participation, and which is all the more surprising since we have a series of countries in which there are structures allowing farmers' organizations to be represented, at the very least uh, uh, to be consulted, in the policies that affect them. Um, so this goes back to, I think, Milun's point about self-determination. Self-determination, um, as stipulated in human rights instruments, is the right for all groups of the population to have their views taken into account in the way state policies are defined. And in fact, although the human rights bodies are cautious about saying this explicitly, the reality is that if you are not well represented in state structures, you have a right to secede, right? Um, and the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has gone almost uh, to the point of saying that explicitly. Um, so my question is really, um, why insist on um, the state uh, leaving peasants alone in some respects and helping them in other respects without insisting on the right to a more democratic state that would take their interests into account by establishing bodies that would uh, allow this? We have time for one last time. Well, my, my, my question actually goes back to Raj's uh, request for class, some sort of class analysis. And um, the thing that <clears throat> I find difficult to think about is um, I work a lot with labor in the US. And last time I checked, labor capital was 28% of all stock on Wall Street um, labor. And so it makes, well, are they part of the transnational? global class that you're talking about, um, and what does it mean to align with them? And I wonder if the issue with them is, is captured in the rights discourse, at least the way we're talking about it, because with them it's really a question of, in my mind, responsibilities. Um, it's, it's because you're not advocating against some other, like a state, you know, you're actually talking to leaders of working class organizations who have no clue. Um, about how to manage their money, um, or even where their money is necessarily. Um, but they do have some responsibility, one could argue, that they're sitting on top of, of these big you know, institutional resources. So how does that fit into our, how we think about class, um, and how we think about transnational capital and cross-class alliances? I want to thank our panelists for a uh, terrific focus on the discussion of rights. Um, we've lost one of our panelists uh, in the meantime, but Ruth gave us, I thought, a, a terrific uh, set of uh, reactions. Um, are there logistical messages about what's happening next? <laughs>
this make a breakdown. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, supposed to break now and have a coffee break and then we have a final session. So perhaps um, a minute each to sum up. Terrific. Or to respond. I, I was in fact, but I wouldn't have it. So each of you, there's a mic you can use if you want to pick out anything that was said. Thank you. Uh, property as direct exclude, I fully agree. Sovereign as direct exclude, I fully agree. And uh, we need to have a property regime that includes. I also fully agree. But I, I think it's not an either or thing that uh, we have to have a property from below that only includes. Uh, we need to look at it from class lenses and we need to exclude. We, we don't want to include in our commons uh, kulaks. Uh, who would exploit all other working classes in, in, in the commons. We don't want uh, uh, local chiefs coming in and uh, uh, manipulating the commons uh, because they have been, and we've seen a lot of, of that. Now, our, my point is that it's not an either or thing to, to include or to exclude, but I think that the electrical relationship of the two, that at the same time that they include, they necessarily should include or uh, exclude. And I think class lenses, while it may not capture fully, would be a useful lens, partly in trying to understand better the dynamics of, of this one. Sovereignty, the, the land sovereignty, I plead guilty, and I, I was very defensive from the very beginning. It's a very awkward term. Uh, we don't like it, we hate it. Uh, we used it for two reasons, in a very tactical way, because one, we want to develop something of an alternative land property regime that plugs right into uh, the, the, the cross-class alliance that is a uh, food sovereignty movement. Uh, so it's more of like, tactically, it, it, it gives you something like, okay, it's in that community. The other one is that it's also a reaction to uh, a tendency to romanticize the community and that a lot of discourse is very community-centric and trying to dismiss the role of the state. And we wanted to bring in the state, not also in a, in a, in a very blind way, uh, but in a, it, with, with a greater understanding of uh, both the, the problematic side of the state and both the, uh, the, the potential uh, progressive uh, part of it as a contested uh, uh, space. Uh, we, who were the, 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 the allies? Uh, I think the strategic allies uh, for a land front, a radical land front, are, are among working classes. Uh, uh, and this is what we're saying, that it's, 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 we, are, we were not thinking about cross-class alliance or forging alliance with uh, forces of capital in, gen in a strategic sense. But in a tactical sense, a section of, uh, of uh, the classes of capital that have no interest of accumulating land and expelling people through land property have always been historically a tactical ally of working classes around the issue of, uh, of property control. Uh, we, we know that national bourgeoisie has always been an ally for uh, a pushing for radical and distributive blood reform. And, and we are thinking about it like that in this sense. But again, the notion of strategic and tactical alliances as well as objective and subjective alliances are useful uh, uh, lenses to think about who are our allies and what are the characters of uh, character of alliances that uh, we would like to uh, push. Adverse incorporation is a weak uh, frame. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's more of like in Sao Paulo when they, when they expand the, it's the, it's the sugar cane biofuels capital of the world when they expand all the way up to 7 million hectares of sugar cane plantation contiguous uh, areas. They basically uh, incorporated all those that came, the, uh, came come their way uh, as sugar cane uh, uh, lease uh, holders and sugar cane plantation workers. Uh, and much of their, and it's, this is the same thing, of course, in a many peasants incorporated into uh, the expansion of the uh, uh, oil palm uh, sector in Indonesia, for example. Uh, many of these struggles there have evolved into a very different thing. You don't hear from these working classes saying that their demand is to get back their land. They become 
property proletariat. Uh, but they don't want to demand to take back their land. But th their demands were more like labor justice demands. Are, th does that make it uh, less uh, compelling or uh, inferior kind of uh, class struggle? Not at all. They are just as difficult and as profound uh, a struggle than the struggle for land to become small plot petty bourgeois uh, peasants. Uh, but but they are very different. Uh, and I think uh, it's more of like how do we see possible uh, overlap and, and, and synergies between uh, class struggles along the Via Campesina way on the one hand, but also how do we bring in uh, the labor justice struggle that has always been, we see, uh, a, a huge uh, divide between these two, which is quite unfortunate, uh, uh, actually. <laughs> Very quick, uh, two points. Uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, Professor Esther and Mila. But I totally agree with you because uh, this is also very important that uh, it is we should be acutely aware of, of the construct of, uh, of also an international law. At the same time, we we can uh, also hope. I mean, there's a in in, in my local language called leasing hope. We already hope, already hope small, but bigger, 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 bigger. Then the formulation of declaration always, always formulate relation and reciprocity with other rights, always. So, person rights always relates with other rights because this is a family of rights, especially with right to put. Second one is on minimum requirement to, to you know, to, to make a progressive uh, move. We need to set minimum, what was the minimum one? And the formulation of state obligations, always there also. So we can we can imagine that different article, especially in the last article of uh, declaration on, on access to justice and uh, to to association organization, could relate to this context to uh, uh, how to participate in state uh, affairs. And uh, the last point I would say only on on the context of uh, if uh, to to use it. If this is achieved, do we will it, will it, uh, we'll see a down downwards uh, feeling? I will say no, because we already prepare uh, the, the follow up. Uh, in Amer American terms, we say that they don't know what 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 uh, they were getting hit or something like that. Yeah. Uh, okay, very quickly. Uh, I hear a lot of concerns. Uh, I'm right enough to write to work. Uh, I think I think the experience of La Via Campesina shows that uh, rights has, has certainly contributed to transnational organizing and mobilization. But now that was just not not any human rights. It was locally appropriated and locally redefined human rights. And I think that's central. And I think we have to keep that in mind. Um, and, and, and in those terms, I've shown that the right to food sovereignty was actually a reactivation or redefinition of both the right to, uh, to self-determination and the right to development, which uh, you know have, have kind of disappeared off the map. Um, and I think that's and, and, and to respond to Olivia, the right to food sovereignty is in the declaration, and I think in that sense uh, there, there is at least an, an entry point for discussing uh, both internal, uh, you know. Uh, Internally and externally, the ability of, of uh, policy making, of, of introducing peasants in, in policy making structures. Uh, on, on who is the enemy and where is the enemy, uh, I recently conducted a research with young environmentalists uh, back in my country, Belgium, and what you find, at least with young people, is really striking. They've uh, so much integrated the constraints of, of our community system and integrated the fact that the enemy is, is within themselves and within ourselves, in the sense that we're all part of this, you know, our pension funds and where we put our savings, etc. And I think that's a, that has a very demobilizing effect, certainly with young people, and I don't have a response to that, but I think, I think identifying the enemy is becoming increasingly uh, difficult. Uh, and on the issue of alliances, uh, I think the challenge for the declaration now will be to move beyond the text of one social group to the text of everyone. Uh, beyond the support of four states, you know, uh, Bolivia, Cuba, South Africa, to uh, not, we won't get the support of all states, but at least to get all states to participate in the negotiations. 
Uh, and I think, yeah, I think that's the challenge that we've had. Thank you. Thanks very much. Please, uh, please join me in thanking you. So break for 10 minutes and uh, we'll coffee uh, and uh, we'll have some lunch.